Section 48, Part 2 of Chapter 18 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book 1, Chapter 18, Part 2. After a corporation is so formed and named, it acquires many powers, rights, capacities, and incapacities, which we are next to consider. Some of these are necessarily and inseparably incident to every corporation, which incidents, as soon as a corporation is duly erected, are tacitly annexed, of course. As, one, to have perpetual succession. This is the very end of its incorporation, for there cannot be a succession for ever without an incorporation, and therefore all aggregate corporations have a power necessarily implied of electing members in the room of such as go off. 2. To sue or be sued, implead or be impleaded, grant or receive, by its corporate name, and do all other acts as natural persons may. 3. To purchase lands, and hold them, for the benefit of themselves and their successors, which two are consequential to the former. 4. To have a common seal, for a corporation, being an invisible body, cannot manifest its intentions by any personal act or oral discourse. It therefore acts and speaks only by its common seal. For, though the particular members may express their private contents to any act, by words or signing their names, yet this does not bind the corporation. It is the fixing of the seal, and that only, which unites the several assents of the individuals, who compose the community, and makes one joint assent of the whole. 5 to make by-laws or private statutes for the better government of the corporation, which are binding upon themselves, unless contrary to the laws of the land, and then they are void. This is also included by law in the very act of incorporation, for as natural reason is given to the natural body for the governing it, so by-laws or statutes are a sort of political reason to govern the body politic. And this right of making by-laws for their own government, not contrary to the law of the land, was allowed by the law of the twelve tables at Rome. But no trading company is, with us, allowed to make by-laws, which may affect the king's prerogative, or the common profit of the people, unless they be approved by the chancellor, treasurer, and chief justices, or the judges of the assizes, in their circuits. These five powers are inseparably incident to every corporation, at least to every corporate aggregate, for two of them, though they may be practised, yet are very unnecessary to a corporation sole, viz. to have a corporate seal to testify his sole assent, and to make statutes for the regulation of his own conduct. There are also certain privileges and disabilities that attend an aggregate corporation, and are not applicable to such as are sole, the reason of them ceasing, and of course the law. It must always appear by attorney, for it cannot appear in person, being, as Sir Edward Coke says, invisible, and existing only in intendment and consideration of law. It can neither maintain, or be made defendant to, an action of battery, or such like personal injuries, for a corporation can neither beat, nor be beaten, in its body politic. A corporation cannot commit treason, or felony, or other crime, in its corporate capacity, though its members may, in their distinct individual capacities. Neither is it capable of suffering traitors or felons punishment, for it is not liable to corporal penalties, nor to attainder, forfeiture, or corruption of blood. It cannot be executor or administrator, or perform any personal duties, for it cannot take an oath for the due execution of the office. It cannot be a trustee, for such kind of confidence is foreign to the ends of its institution. Neither can it be compelled to perform such a trust, because it cannot be committed to prison. For its existence being ideal, no man can apprehend or arrest it. And therefore also it cannot be outlawed, for outlawry always supposes a precedent right of arresting, which has been defeated by the parties absconding, and that also a corporation cannot do. For which reasons the proceedings to compel a corporation to appear to any suit by attorney are always by distress on their lands and goods. Neither can a corporation be excommunicated, for it has no soul, as is gravely observed by Sir Edward Coke, and therefore also it is not liable to be summoned into the ecclesiastical courts upon any account, for those courts act only pro salute anime, and their sentences can only be enforced by spiritual censures, a consideration which, carried to its full extent, would alone demonstrate the impropriety of these courts interfering in any temporal rights whatsoever. 
There are also other incidents and powers, which belong to some sort of corporations, and not to others. An aggregate corporation may take goods and chattels for the benefit of themselves and their successors, but a sole corporation cannot, for such movable property is liable to be lost or embezzled, and would raise a multitude of disputes between the successor and executor, which the law is careful to avoid. In ecclesiastical and eleemosynary foundations, the king or the founders may give them rules, laws, statutes, and ordinances, which they are bound to observe, but corporations merely lay, constituted for civil purposes, are subject to no particular statutes, but to the common law, and to their own by-laws, not contrary to the laws of the realm. Aggregate corporations also, that have, by their constitution, a head, as a dean, warden, master, or the like, cannot do any acts during the vacancy of the headship, except only appointing another. Neither are they then capable of receiving a grant, for such corporation is incapable without a head. But there may be a corporation aggregate constituted without a head, as the Collegiate Church of Southwell in Nottinghamshire, which consists only of prebendaries, and the governors of the Charter House, London, who have no president or superior, but are all of equal authority. In aggregate corporations also, the act of the major part is esteemed the act of the whole. By the civil law this major part must have consisted of two-thirds of the whole, else no act could be performed, which perhaps may be one reason why they required three at least to make a corporation. But with us any majority is sufficient to determine the act of the whole body. And whereas, notwithstanding the law stood thus, some founders of corporations had made statutes in derogation of the common law, making very frequently the unanimous assent of the society to be necessary to any corporate act, which King Henry the Eighth found to be a great obstruction to his projected scheme of obtaining a surrender of the lands of ecclesiastical corporations, it was therefore enacted by Statute 33, Henry the Eighth, C. 27, that all private statutes shall be utterly void, whereby any grant or election, made by the head, with the concurrence of the major part of the body, is liable to be obstructed by any one or more, being the minority. But this statute extends not to any negative or necessary voice given by the founder to the head of any such society. We have before observed that it was incident to every corporation to have a capacity to purchase lands for themselves and successors, and this is regularly true at the common law. But they are accepted out of the statute of wills, so that no devise of lands to a corporation by will is good, except for charitable uses, by statute 43, Elizabeth, c. 4. And also, by a great variety of statutes, their privilege even of purchasing from any living grantor is greatly abridged, so that now a corporation, either ecclesiastical or lay, must have a license from the king to purchase, before they can exert that capacity which is vested in them by the common law. Nor is even this in all cases sufficient." These statutes are generally called the statutes of mortmen, all purchases made by corporate bodies being said to be purchases in mortmen, in mortua manu, for the reason of which appellation Sir Edward Coke offers many conjectures, but there is one which seems more probable than any that he has given us, viz., that these purchases being usually made by ecclesiastical bodies, the members of which, being professed, were reckoned dead persons in law, land, therefore, holden by them, might with great propriety be said to be held in mortua manu. I shall defer the more particular exposition of these statutes of Mortman till the next book of these commentaries, when we shall consider the nature and tenures of estates, and also the exposition of those disabling statutes of Queen Elizabeth, which restrain spiritual and eleemosynary corporations from alienating such lands as they are present in legal possession of, only mentioning them in this place for the sake of regularity, as statutable incapacities incident and relative to corporations. The general duties of all bodies politic, considered in their corporate capacity, may, like those of natural persons, be reduced to this single one, that of acting up to the end or design, whatever it be, for which they were created by their founder. 3. I proceed therefore next to inquire how these corporations may be visited, for corporations being composed of individuals, subject to human frailties, are liable, as well as private persons, to deviate from the end of their institution. And for that reason the law is provided proper persons to visit, inquire into, and correct all irregularities that arise in such corporations, either sole or aggregate, and whether ecclesiastical, civil, or eleemosynary. 
With regard to all ecclesiastical corporations, the ordinary is their visitor, so constituted by the canon law, and from thence derived to us. The Pope formerly, and now the King, as supreme ordinary, is the visitor of the Archbishop or Metropolitan. The Metropolitan has the charge and coercion of all his suffragan bishops, and the bishops in their several dioceses are the visitors of all deans and chapters, of all parsons and vicars, and of all other spiritual corporations. With respect to all lay corporations, the founder, his heirs, or assigns, are the visitors, whether the foundation be civil or eleemosynary, for in a lay corporation the ordinary neither can nor ought to visit. I know it is generally said that civil corporations are subject to no visitation, but merely to the common law of the land, and this shall be presently explained. But first, as I have laid it down as a rule that the founder, his heirs, or assigns, are the visitors of all lay corporations, let us inquire what is meant by the founder. The founder of all corporations, in the strictest and original sense, is the king alone, for he only can incorporate a society, and in civil incorporations, such as mayor and commonality, etc., where there are no possessions or endowments given to the body, there is no other founder but the king, but in eleemosynary foundations, such as colleges and hospitals, where there is an endowment of lands, the law distinguishes and makes two species of foundation, the one fundatio incipiens, or the incorporation, in which sense the king is the general founder of all colleges and hospitals, the other fundatio perficiens, or the dotation of it, in which sense the first gift of the revenues is the foundation, and he who gives them is in law the founder, and it is in this last sense that we generally call a man the founder of a college or hospital. But here the king has his prerogative, for if the king and a private man join in endowing an eleemosynary foundation, the king alone shall be the founder of it. And in general, the king being the sole founder of all civil corporations, and the endower the proficient founder of all eleemosynary ones, the right of visitation of the former results, according to the rule laid down to the king, and of the latter to the patron or endower. The king being thus constituted by law the visitor of all civil corporations, the law has also appointed the place, wherein he shall exercise this jurisdiction, which is the court of the king's bench, where, and where only, all misbehaviors of this kind of corporations are inquired into and redressed, and all their controversies decided. And this is what I understand to be the meaning of our lawyers, when they say that these civil corporations are liable to no visitation, that is, that the law having by immemorial usage appointed them to be visited and inspected by the king, their founder, in his majesty's court of king's bench, according to the rules of the common law, they ought not to be visited elsewhere, or by any other authority. And this is so strictly true, that though the king, by his letters patent, had subjected the College of Physicians to the visitation of four very respectable persons, the Lord Chancellor, the two Chief Justices, and the Chief Baron, though the College had accepted this charter with all possible marks of acquiescence, and had acted under it for nearly a century, yet in 1753 the authority of this provision coming in dispute, on an appeal preferred to those supposed visitors, they directed the legality of their own appointment to be argued, and, as this College was a mere civil, and not an eleemosynary foundation, they at length determined, upon several days' solemn debate, that they had no jurisdiction as visitors, and remitted the appellant, if aggrieved, to his regular remedy in His Majesty's Court of the King's Bench. As to eleemosynary corporations, by the dotation the founder and his heirs are of common right the legal visitors, to see that the property is rightly employed, which would otherwise have descended to the visitor himself. But if the founder has appointed and assigned any other person to be visitor, then his assignee so appointed is invested with all the founder's power, in exclusion of his heir. Eleemosynary corporations are chiefly hospitals or colleges in the university. These were all of them considered by the popish clergy as of mere ecclesiastical jurisdiction. However, the law of the land judged otherwise, and, with regard to hospitals, it has long been held that if a hospital be spiritual, the bishop shall visit, but if lay, the patron. This right of lay patrons was indeed abridged by statute Second Henry V, C. 1, which ordained that the ordinary should visit all hospitals founded by subjects, though the king's right was reserved, to visit by his commissioners such as were of royal foundation. But the subject's right was in part restored by statute 14th Elizabeth C. 5, 
which directs the bishop to visit such hospitals only, where no visitor is appointed by the founders thereof, and all the hospitals founded by virtue of the statute 39 Elizabeth C. 5, are to be visited by such persons as shall be nominated by the respective founders. But still, if the founder appoints nobody, the bishop of the diocese must visit." Colleges in the universities, whatever the common law may now or might formerly judge, were certainly considered by the popish clergy, under whose direction they were, as ecclesiastical, or at least clerical corporations, and therefore the right of visitation was claimed by the ordinary of the diocese. This is evident, because in many of our most ancient colleges, where the founder had a mind to subject them to a visitor of his own nomination, he obtained for that purpose a papal bull to exempt them from the jurisdiction of the ordinary, several of which are still preserved in the archives of the respective societies. And I have reason to believe that in one of our colleges, wherein the bishop of that diocese, in which Oxford was formerly comprised, has immemorially exercised visitorial authority, there is no special visitor appointed by the college statutes, so that the bishop's interposition can be ascribed to nothing else but his supposed title as ordinary to visit this, among other ecclesiastical foundations. And it is not impossible that the number of colleges in Cambridge, which are visited by the bishop of Eli, may in part be derived from the same original. But whatever might be formerly the opinion of the clergy, it is now held as an established common law that colleges are lay corporations, though sometimes totally composed of ecclesiastical persons, and that the right of visitation does not arise from any principles of the canon law, but of necessity was created by the common law. And yet the power and jurisdiction of visitors in colleges was left so much in the dark at common law, that the whole doctrine was very unsettled till King William's time, in the sixth year of whose reign, the famous case of Phillips and Bury happened. In this the main question was, whether the sentence of the Bishop of Exeter, who, as visitor, had deprived Dr. Bury, the rector of Exeter College, could be examined and redressed by the court of King's Bench. And the three Pusney judges were of opinion that it might be reviewed, for that the visitor's jurisdiction could not exclude the common law, and accordingly judgment was given at that court." But the Lord Chief Justice, Holt, was of a contrary opinion, and held that by the common law the office of visitor is to judge according to the statutes of the college, and to expel and deprive upon just occasions, and to hear all appeals of course, and that from him and him only the party grieved ought to have redress, the founder having reposed in him so entire a confidence that he will administer justice impartially, that his determinations are final, and examinable in no other court whatsoever." And upon this, a writ of error being brought in the House of Lords, they reversed the judgment of the Court of King's Bench, and concurred in Sir John Holt's opinion. And to this leading case all subsequent determinations have been conformable. But where the visitor is under a temporary disability, there the Court of King's Bench will interpose, to prevent a defect of justice. Thus the Bishop of Chester is visitor of Manchester College, but happening also to be warden, the court held that his power was suspended during the union of those offices, and therefore issued a peremptory mandamus to him, as warden, to admit a person entitled to a chaplainship. Also it is said that if a founder of an eleemosynary foundation appoints a visitor, and limits his jurisdiction by rules and statutes, if the visitor in his sentence exceeds those rules, an action lies against him, but it is otherwise where he mistakes in a thing within his power. 4. We come now in the last place to consider how corporations may be dissolved. Any particular member may be disenfranchised, or lose his place in the corporation, by acting contrary to the laws of the society, or the laws of the land, or he may resign it by his own voluntary act. But the body politic may also itself be dissolved in several ways, which dissolution is the civil death of the corporation, and in this case their lands and tenements shall revert to the person, or his heirs, who granted them to the corporation. For the law doth annex a condition to every such grant, that if the corporation be dissolved, the grantor shall have the lands again. Because the cause of the grant faileth. The grant is indeed only during the life of the corporation, which may endure for ever, but, when that life is determined by the dissolution of the body politic, the grantor takes it back by reversion, as in the case of every other grant for life. And hence it appears how injurious, as well to private as public rights, 
those statutes were, which vested in King Henry the Eighth instead of the heirs of the founder, the lands of the dissolved monasteries. The debts of a corporation, either to or from it, are totally extinguished by its dissolution, so that the members thereof cannot recover, or be charged with them in their natural capacities, agreeable to that maxim of the civil law, si quid universitati debitur, singulis non debitur, nec quod debit universitas, singuli debent. A corporation may be dissolved, one, by act of Parliament, which is boundless in its operations, two, by the natural death of all its members, in case of an aggregate corporation, three, by surrender of its franchises into the hands of the king, which is a kind of suicide, four, by forfeiture of its charter, through negligence or abuse of its franchises, in which case the law judges that the body politic has broken the condition upon which it was incorporated, and thereupon the incorporation is void. And the regular course is to bring a writ of quo ranto, to inquire by what warrant the members now exercise their corporate power, having forfeited it by such and such proceedings. The exertion of this act of law, for the purposes of the State, in the reigns of King Charles and King James the Second, particularly by seizing the charter of the City of London, gave great and just offence, though perhaps, in strictness of law, the proceedings were sufficiently regular. But now it is enacted that the charter of the City of London shall never more be forfeited for any cause whatsoever. And because the common law corporations were dissolved, in case the mayor or head officer was not duly elected on the day appointed in the charter or established by prescription, it is now provided that for the future no corporation shall be dissolved upon that account, and ample directions are given for appointing a new officer, in case there be no election, or avoid one, made upon the charter or prescriptive day. End of section 48 End of the first book of the Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone